In September 1939, Britain stood on the brink of the Second World War. To avoid defeat, one battle would become more important than any other. The battle to produce food. Two-thirds of Britain's food was imported. And now it was under threat from a Nazi blockade. To feed the nation, an agricultural revolution of epic proportions was needed to at least double homegrown food production. Churchill called the farms of Britain the front line of freedom. Now, historian Ruth Goodman and archaeologists Alex Langlands and Peter Ginn are turning the clock back. We're about to embark on the greatest challenge ever faced by British agriculture, Peter, on the Second World War. the next year, they'll work Manor Farm in Hampshire, as it would have been during the Second World War. Onward! March! Come on, quick march! Here, the team will relive the struggle of wartime farmers to maximise food production. The plough really had become a weapon of war. Cope with shortages. Whoa, that is a bit of kit. Experience social revolution in the countryside. Whoa! And protect and defend the south coast from the threat of invasion. Four men, evidence of explosives. This is the untold story of the countryside at war. In 1939, Britain's farmers prepared for war. Now Alex, Ruth and Peter are on their way to their new farm in Hampshire. A few miles in from the south coast, near the ports of Southampton and Portsmouth, during the war, this was the front line against the Nazis. Like troops, farmers too were being mobilised. So important was their job to the nation's survival that farming would become a reserved occupation, exempt from military conscription. 60% of our food was being imported. Just so easy, isn't it, for the Germans to just cut off the supply? A ring of U-boats surrounding the British Isles, effectively starving us to death. Suddenly, all the overseas food on which Britain so depended was in jeopardy. German U-boats and warships threatened to destroy convoys transporting supplies across the Atlantic. To make things worse, farming in Britain had been in recession since the end of the First World War. And now they'd have to double production. You know, this is probably one of the greatest challenges that British agriculture had ever faced. Absolutely. How to turn it round after 20 years of neglect and a reinvestment in the countryside. But the main thing, we've got a new team member. Isn't that right, Henry? <laughs> you right about that, Henry? He's going to make all the difference, isn't he? I think he almost <laughs> certainly will. There you go. Oh, it's oh. really pretty. What a farm. God. Beautiful, isn't it? This is Manor Farm, eight miles from Southampton, which they will work on for the coming year. Handing over the keys is farm manager Hi. David Trenchard. Hello, David. David. Alex. Alex. Yep. With Hello. pleasure. Fantastic farm you've got here. Yes. <laughs> That's why. Yes, it is. I think it's you know it's a you know you wouldn't find a more typical Hampshire farm than this. You know. Where's our first port well, of I call going to be? We're starting the yard and look at the stock. Great okay. stuff. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. You. Manor Farm was typical of the 1930s. 
cheap cereal crops imported from the United States and Canada meant British farmers could no longer compete. So instead of growing crops, they concentrated on livestock. Ah, the pigs. These are, these are the pigs, yes. Um, we keep two breeds on the farm at the moment. We keep saddlebacks, and this is middle whites. Right. Good old, you know, mm -hmm. pig for your sausages and everything else. You know, in fact, they are a rare breed. Right, yeah. yeah. Good girl, good girl. <laughs> there you go. Ah, here's your girls. Here's our girls. You can tell they're milkers. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Very good milkers. We actually got a Guernsey, a Jersey, and an Ayrshire there. Right. I mean, this close to somewhere like Southampton, you know, there's definitely going to be a market for milk, yeah, isn't there? Yeah, yeah. This is our milking parlour. Wow! Hey! That's a modern milking machine! Oh, the cups for the teats. I mean, it's such a reduction in labour. Yes, yeah, we have modernised, yeah. So this really is the 1939 state-of-the-art milking parlour? This is it, yes. Don't just sit on that stool Fantastic. every morning spending 20 minutes <laughs> milking a cake, eh? yeah. <laughs> Before the war, Manor Farm also had beef cattle, sheep, workshops, petrol-powered farm equipment, nearby a wartime village hall. Ooh, look at this! Dancermania Foxtrot. Wow, old gramophone records. The one I love, a Foxtrot. Right, so we're definitely between the two wars here, aren't we? Mm. This must have been ringing, this place. Such yeah. a popular thing to do during the war, Dancermania. Well, thing. judging by the state <laughs> of this place, it was an awesome party. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We've got this fantastic archaeological record here, haven't we? Of Mm. of life yeah. during the war, really. Absolutely. At the heart of the farm is a row of cottages. Here, Alex, Peter and Ruth will experience wartime domestic life. Ah, the kitchen. Ah. Yeah, oh, nice look. Nice light. It's a local stove. It's tiny. How am I supposed to manage with that? This coal cooking range dates from well before the First World War. By the 1930s, they were being superseded by cleaner and more efficient cookers. Look, look, I'll show you what I want. I've been yeah, looking. I've been look, look, see? That's what I want. Oh, yeah. What's what that? Gas, is it? That's an electric cooker. I mean, there's gas cookers and electric cookers going in like crazy all across Britain. It's clean, takes far less work, and the government is actually saying that with war coming, we're going to know we're going to be short of coal, we're going to need that fuel for other things, mm. that electricity is much more efficient. It's really encouraging people to move over to electric cooking. So the lady gets a new cooker because it's all part of the war effort, is what you're trying to say to us, really? Yeah. And I'm really looking forward to bringing this place back to life and seeing what it was like living in rural Britain during the Second World War. Wartime in many people's minds is all about guns and aeroplanes and tanks and young men in uniform. But it's also a period in which the British countryside and British country people really came back into their own. Timber! The farmers had to produce food and provide accommodation for a huge section of the population. It was an enormously important part of the war effort, and I do think that sometimes it gets forgotten. This is an opportunity to explore an untold history. Here we've got a very, very different battle being fought, a battle really for food, and that untold story is one that I'm, I'm just thrilled to be exploring. Even before war was declared, the government anticipated that a German blockade would drastically reduce food imports, so Britain would have to feed itself. To do so, farmers would have to increase their harvests. Over there we've got Dockdale Coppice. The government set up war agricultural executive committees in every county to drive through these changes. Known as war ags, they had the power to tell farmers what fields to plough up. 
So Alex and Peter are surveying the farm's 30 acres to see how it can be done. So this is Manor Farm here. Yep, that's the farm. And we're bound by the River Hamble here. Yep. Coming around in this horseshoe shape. So all of these fields round here, OK, would relate to Manor Farm. But, of course, the majority of this land was all being used for rearing livestock. Yep. But using land for livestock production was not the most efficient way of feeding the nation. It's a simple principle, really, isn't it? Instead of growing all of this feed, Mm. to feed animals, yeah. to slaughter, <laughs> to then feed people, why don't you actually just grow the feed and feed the people directly? And it's a much more economic way of feeding because you lose a lot of that calorific value from the original food by putting it through livestock before you feed people. You know, 1939, uh, war breaks out. You had months to get around your farm, as we'll be doing, and looking at the fields and saying, that wheat, that beans, that barley, and that's exactly what we're going to have to do, aren't we? We are. Over the six years of conflict, the War Ag instructed farmers to grow an extra six and a half million acres of crops, a total area bigger than Wales. Many farmers were ill-equipped for this monumental challenge, as they didn't have the machinery or suitable land. Welcome to the Badlands. If I were a potter, I could make my fortune here. It is beautiful, beautiful clay. But at the moment, this clay is a hindrance. The water, it sits on it. If we attempted to grow crops here, they'd be ruined. So we need to find some way of draining this, this sitting water, and then we'll be able to grow a fantastic crop. It actually, according to the map, dips away towards a brook in the bottom of the field. So I am worried about sitting water. In this field, they've decided to grow wheat, used to produce bread. Got a leaflet here, Peter. This is what the uh, ministry have furnished me with. Mole drainage for heavy land. What the war ag is recommending is the use of a mole subsoiler. Essentially, it's kind of deep cultivation, if you like. It's like a little torpedo that is dragged through the soil at a depth of what, Peter? About uh, just, just over a foot. OK. A foot to a foot and a half. Just over a foot. It's, so got, it's got to be deeper than the ploughing. It's going to yeah. happen. Traditionally, farmers had drained fields with hand-dug ditches and clay pipes. But using a mole subsoiler was much quicker and cheaper and used extensively during the war. First, they need to survey the field to find out which way it slopes. Now, it might look obvious to start with, but I can see already that we've got a dip in there. And there's a danger that if we just drained all the way down to this point, OK, even if we drained through it, we'd still get a build-up of water in this area. As archaeologists, surveying is second nature to Alex and Peter. Yeah, there, yeah, perfect. Uh, and just work down a little bit. So, sort of here? Yeah. OK. So that's what, five, five feet seven? About five, six. Five, six. There we go. OK, Alex, should we do another, another line? Knowing the lay of the land, they can work out where to use the mole subsoiler to make underground drainage channels. Doubling food production put enormous demands on labour, so women were drafted to work on the land. This made it important to reduce housework by modernising the kitchen. Ruth's called on expert in household technology, Dr Karen Sayer. Oh, you've caught me. I'm still cleaning. Hello. <laughs> Come on in. Come on in. Sorry. That's fine. I'm absolutely filthy. Lovely to see you. Good to see you mm. too. I found this fantastic picture in my book here about um, furniture oh, and, and yes. you know how to lay out the home and that. You see? That. That's just well, exactly what see. I had in mind. We've got you know your electric cookers. You've got your kitchenettes. You know it's a modern, new kitchen oh, ready. I have to disappoint you a little bit. Oh. The, <laughs> the kitchenette 
burner is fine, mm -hmm. but electric cooker is going to be a big problem. Do you have mains electricity? No, not the mains. So the fact that we're not on the grid mm. here, was that common for farms that at the outbreak of war? Absolutely, that was the majority of farms were not on the grid. In 1939, just one in ten rural houses had mains electricity. But there was an alternative. A portable petrol-powered generator. Philip Everson has brought one along. You got it going. Yes. Hopefully now we can have some light. So that looks frankly like you're about to restart Frankenstein. Well, it would probably do that as well. But first <laughs> of all, we should have light. Oh wow! wow. <laughs> this is a 50 volt set. 50 it runs volts. 50 volts yeah. and up to a thousand watts. Yeah. It's a sort of what you'd call a cottage lighting plant. Yeah. So you run the engine during the day to charge a set of batteries up. And then when they were fully charged, you'd put the lights on at night so you'd have the lights without listening to the engine running, and you'd use the engine to keep the batteries charged. Well, that's quite a sort of doable thing. Yeah, we absolutely. could use it to light a workshop, we could use it to light the house. Absolutely, yeah. And were there a lot of these about? They made these engines from 1926 up until 1964, and the actual basic engines, they made a quarter of a million of them. They were one of the most successful small power engines ever made in the UK. They were almost impossible to kill. You could work them and abuse them, and they still came back for more, so the farmers loved them. Before they can sow the wheat, the team need a mole subsoiler to improve the drainage. But low incomes during the agricultural depression meant farmers didn't have the money to buy equipment. So like farmers of the time, Peter must improvise by calling on the services of a blacksmith like Simon Summers. It's this essentially bullet-shaped piece of iron okay. that gets dragged through the ground and it leaves in its wake a channel. Basically, like, I suppose, a pipe without any Yeah, yeah, piping. you want a solid bit of iron. You need some strength there, don't you, for that? Serious strength. Yeah. All right. Because this is quite an undertaking. In 1939, scrap metal was going to the war effort for armaments production, resulting in shortages. Well, that, that looks like the base of a, a seed drill. Yeah, there's some good wheels on that. The blacksmith, whose craft had long been in decline, now found himself once more in demand. There's an adjustable linkage there, so that could go onto the tractor. He had the skill to make do and mend, turning rusty metal into new machines. The thing I'm most concerned about is the actual physical lump of metal that has to get dragged yeah. through the ground. That's iron, that is. That's iron, that's, is that's it? That's raw iron, that shaft is, yeah. Well, that's pretty We could use that. Thick. Thing. Yeah, it's good quality iron, this. Henry, we're looking for iron, not potatoes. In the forge, Simon begins the process of transforming the scrap iron axle into a brand new mould. OK. That's it. Now we're going to put it back in the fire so it don't take long to heat up. The first okay, job is to make a bullet-shaped nose on the mould so it can be pulled easily through the clay soil. Um, this is where the sledge comes in and you're going to follow my pattern. You tell me where to hit and I hit it. Yep. OK. Right, we're just driving this in to cut a slot. We've got to be very careful because it's so hot. Simon has to keep cooling the tool, otherwise it'll get stuck in there and we'll essentially forge the two together. Off to... That's perfect. Once the fields have been drained with Peter's mole subsoiler, they'll be returned to bare earth by ploughing. But Alex has spotted another problem. You can't plough a field, OK, when it's got big, thick sward, you know, a, a thick grass on the top of it. It just doesn't work. You've got to have it eaten down so it's almost like a carpet. To do this, Alex is calling on the beef cattle, reared by Debbie Underwood. So you've built up a real rapport then with this, this, this herd? This one we've had 
since she was two weeks old. Really? I used to pick her up and carry her around. Oh, I don't do that anymore. No, I can imagine. And she's like a lovely, soppy Labrador. This is Abigail. Abigail. Yeah, and she's gorgeous. Come on, then. But back then, this herd would have faced an uncertain future. You know, you would have had farmers, very much like Debbie here, who uh, you know, had grown up with cattle all their life. But with war looming and this desire to grow more cereals, and the Ministry for Agriculture wasn't going to reward farmers who kept beef, cattle. Come on. It will take the cattle about three weeks to graze this grass, ready for ploughing. This is my new kitchenette. I'm so pleased with this. Like Ruth and Karen are furnishing the kitchen with labour-saving devices. Isn't it lovely? A lovely enamel surface, easy to wipe down, all for your pastry preparation. Absolutely perfect. All your food storage, yes. all cleanly. Yes. Tidied away, it's great, isn't it? With the generator finally connected up, Ruth has electric light in the cottage. <laughs> Fantastic! <laughs> Hopefully she'll have better luck with the radio. <laughs> Whoops! <laughs> of course, this is how you're going to get all the news of current affairs and what's happening. Um, particularly as you go further into the war, um, the newspapers themselves have to be cut down incredibly. Sometimes they're only sort of four sides at a time. Right. So the so best way of, of finding out exactly what's going on. And this is really is your connection with the it's wider world. It's your connection with the wider world, absolutely. Electricity also meant new labour saving gadgets. Oh, <laughs> no, we're joking. Perfect appliance to make your life so oh, much easier. How am I doing that? Traditionally, an iron was a piece of flat metal heated on a coal range. Now, they were replaced by ones you could simply plug in. So it's a bayonet or like a bulb? It's a bayonet exactly like a bulb. That's it. Whoa. Wow! <laughs> now, how much faster is that? That's not only fast, but that's so clean. It's so clean. You don't have to worry about smuts getting on no. your laundry. Small generators weren't capable of powering large appliances, though, like electric cookers. But there was a modern, convenient replacement for the oh, coal range. They're supposed to just stand freestanding, no plumbing in. There's no so, fixing to anything, it's just a little standalone box. Well, again, this is the way forward. This is modernity. So it's just a series of flat paraffin lamps. Yep. This is nothing new, is it? No, it's just exactly like oil lamps. People would have been very used to using this. And that helps with the idea of the adoption of the technology as well. And you can see that in the styling. It's all sort of like painted black to look like a range, and yes. yet it's made of really thin sheet metal. Absolutely. And that's to make people feel very comfortable. I'm really looking forward to cooking on this. I bet you are. It's going to be so different. It's going to be so much easier, presumably. No smoke. And you're not having to shovel coal or anthracite no. or anything. And much less labour intensive. OK, you get sledge, Peter. Yeah. To drain the boggy land for cereal production, Peter and blacksmith Sorry. Simon Summers are making a mole subsoiler. Mark it down, yeah? Right, got you. So far, they've made the head of the mole. Next, they must make a strong bracket to hold it in place below the ground. Now we need to cut an up, make another cut up here. Right. OK, move it along. Probably oh, yeah. about th there, OK. But the best they can find is a rusty Victorian cartwheel rim. It's really good iron. It's such a waste if we don't reuse it. Once we get up to a certain temperature, the rust just comes off, so it'd just be like bright new iron again. The bracket's finished. Now to attach it to the mole itself. Oh. Right, here comes the hot rivet. In it goes. So through, it catches, mushroom. OK, flip. 
you can see why blacksmiths went deaf. <laughs> and there we have it, entirely made from scrap iron that we found in the hedgerow. Yep. Old machineries that we've turned into a new machine. Fantastic. Yep. Peter is building a chassis to carry his mole subsoiler. So hopefully this is going to aid keeping the mole in the ground. And, dear Lord, there we go. Slide that in like that. This project is a, a, a mix of quite intense stress, because obviously it's got to be done, it's got to be done to a certain time limit, but also one of immense joy, because it's just so much fun to have a workshop, to have a forge, to be able to tinker around. All good, all good stuff. Peter will need a machine to pull the mole subsoiler through the ground. But in 1939, there were 20 horses to every tractor on Britain's farms. If farmers were to double food production to meet the demands of war, they'd have to replace horsepower with mechanical power. Unlike horses, tractors don't need to rest. Pete Diggs, who has farmed in this area his whole life, is giving Alex and Ruth a lesson in driving the most popular wartime tractor, the Fordson. Hello, Peter. So this is her, is it? She's going to do all the work for us? Well, we hope so. <laughs> You've got a nice sprung seat here. There's no cushions, but uh, I can remember putting straw into a jute sack. Right, yeah. And tying that on. Yeah. It was much more comfortable on the bum. I bet it was. <laughs> but it's no easy job starting it. Make sure you've got plenty of oil there. OK. During the war, tractor numbers on British farms would more than triple, from 55,000 to over 175,000. But the Fordson was notoriously difficult to start, as Ruth's about to discover. And then wind with the starting handle. Should we make Ruth crank this, do you think? Oh, you'll have muscles now. <laughs> I've got muscles. <laughs> Shapers. Doubling crop production would need a huge increase in labour, so women were called upon to drive the tractors. <laughs> Much easier to take a horse out of a stable. <laughs> Probably quicker at my rate and all. Ooh, did you oh. hear that? Ooh, nearly, nearly. <laughs> <laughs> How you doing, Dominic? No. Oh. What kind of wartime attitude we need, Ruth. Oh. Congratulations, Ruth. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> 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 Let's uh, let her get on with it, Peter. Yes. Pete was just seven when war broke out, and he witnessed the transition from horsepower to mechanical power. That was Captain and that was Dick. And as you see, I started very, very young. Yeah. <laughs> I love this look. That's you there on top of that. It's a big dray, isn't it? That's it. And I take it these aren't your boots here? No, that is my father's. And wow. I nicked them one day and was off the end of the farm. Well, you wanted to be a farmer from a very young age. That's it. Come on, darling, come on. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Was that, were you attempting I second? Was trying, I was trying second. You were attempting second gear? Yeah. I'd better go over there and see. <laughs> In the workshop, Peter's mole subsoiler is taking shape. But there aren't enough hours of daylight to get it finished in time. Using the generator to light the workshop should help. This is going to make such a difference. 
because it's going to enable me to work throughout the evening. If they don't get the fields drained and ploughed in the next few days, they won't get the wheat crop sown in time. Ah, finally. There we go. Oh, dear. On the 3rd of September, 1939, at quarter past 11 in the morning, Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain made the announcement the nation had been bracing itself for. This morning, the British ambassador in Berlin handed the German government a final note, stating that unless we heard from them by 11 o'clock, that they were prepared at once to withdraw their troops from Poland, a state of war would exist between us. I have to tell you now that no such undertaking has been received and that consequently this country is at war with Germany. Somebody was my age in 1939 I'd have been in my mid-twenties in the first war. The sort of age, you know, you're losing husbands, you're losing mm. brothers. Yep. You have such a strong experience of it. And then, you know, here it is all again. So you're sat here, you're listening to Chamberlain say, you know, I regret to tell you, we're now at war again against the same people. You could lose your husband in the first war and your son in the second. I mean... Even so, you'd be sat here looking out the window. Yeah. Scarcely able to believe it. I Beautiful mean, summer's of, day like yeah. this. Britain was now expecting to be bombed by the Nazis at any time. Air raid precaution wardens were tasked with protecting the population. Steve Taylor is an expert in wartime civil defence. One. You. Two, one for you. The government assumed that the Nazis would use poison gas on the population, so a gas mask was issued to every man, woman and child in the country. How do we know there's going to be a gas attack? Are we just looking out ourselves for, for bombers? Or? You will hear either an air raid siren or a rattle. I've got the gas rattle here, I can right. show you. So once you hear that, it's gas mask on immediately. But as soon as there's an all clear, there'll be an all clear siren or my trusty ARP whistle. <whistles> we'll tell you it's all clear. Right, OK. It was also feared Britain would suffer night bombing. A total blackout on the ground would make locating the target much more difficult for the enemy. Steve's demonstrating how doors were blacked out using a light break. OK, so uh, it's sort of late at night, um, yeah. uh, but there's some sort of kerfuffle in the farmyard. A kerfuffle. Sound of a fox yeah. uh, at the chickens. I go in here. In here. Make sure I've closed the Make curtain Make sure you've first. got the curtain closed and okay. then open the door. And door open. Now, can you see any light coming in around the edges? Only through the moth holes. There we go. To black out the windows, Alex and Peter are making removable frames. Blackout frame. Not a single pinprick. Proper job, mate. Right, fantastic. Fantastic, that is a great job. Now all we need to do is to get that blackout curtain up, isn't it? But all you need to do is get that blackout curtain up. Right. Others have bowl plows. Of course. You need to get that done, don't you? With war, the threat of German U-boats cutting off imports became a reality. It wasn't just staple foods like wheat that were under threat. Imported fruits containing vitamin C were essential to the health of the nation, particularly children. As a boy, Ruth's father, Jeff Steely, was sent into the countryside to forage for alternatives. I remember you telling me all about doing this, picking rose hips. Yes. Yeah, How would. much did they pay you? Tuppence a pound. Tuppence a pound. <laughs> Which was quite good for pocket money days, it really was. To... And if you did it on the wet days, of course, they, they weighed more, <laughs> uh, which was quite good. That was your compensation for being out in bad weather. <laughs> um, 
And with all the men away, it was left to the women, and largely the boys, to go round the hedges, find apples, pick these berries, and I so mean, forth. Why rose hips so much? Because there's not much food value in them, is there? Ah, but there, there's vitamin C. So all the sources of vitamin C we've got used to, all the oranges and lemons, well, are no yeah. longer coming in. No, and limes, all that sort of Mediterranean-type stuff couldn't get through. So and we're scratching about trying to find yeah. native British yeah, that's equivalents. Right. Ruth's preserving the rose hips in syrup so it can be taken throughout the winter. The long, slow, gentle cooking has suited them quite well. So now I just need to strain all that liquid off. Ooh, look at the colour! So what I'm getting out here now, really, is the... Well, it's the vitamin C is what we're after. And that fleshy bit around the seed, it's just like making jam or jelly, really. Arrgh. And once this is all drained out, I'll just have to make it into a syrup with sugar. The sugar's there to preserve the fruit. Then when I bottle it, it'll keep. Just like dancing, Alex. Finally, Peter's mole subsoiler is finished. team can drain the field in preparation for sowing the wheat. Finally, all those hours out the shed. Yep. It's quite a contraption, isn't it? I've got a plan that Peter and I, we surveyed the field, we put in all the levels, but I think the first thing to do is to just concentrate. We're up here on just getting in these main drains. Yeah. Before Peter's contraption can prove itself, there's the perennial problem of getting the tractor to start. Damn the Fordson. <laughs> Damn it. Oh. not going according to plan. Ideally, the mole should be cutting a channel about a foot beneath the surface. When war broke out, there were almost four million acres of land like this that needed draining. OK, let's, let's go. The problem is, it's just pulled it the path of least resistance, which is up out of the ground. It's clear the chassis built by Peter is too light to keep the mole in the ground. In a corner of the farmyard, Alex has found a much heavier chassis to fit Peter's mole subsoiler to. The sun's nearly down. That's it, lovely. That's wonderful. But things are about to go from bad to worse. The improvised bracket holding the mole has bent because it isn't strong enough. That's that then, isn't it? Time is running out to get the crop sown, so they'll have to abandon draining the field. As Peter has discovered, improvising farm machinery is no easy task. But for the wartime farmer, this could have been disastrous and incurred the wrath of the war ag. If our fields flood, you know, the war ag would look at us and they would say, we need to move them on. Mm. So we just better hope against hopes that we have an extremely dry summer. A 
The farmer's duties to the nation didn't end with attempting to double crop production. Their knowledge of the landscape made them invaluable recruits to one of the war's most secret organizations, the auxiliary units. Your names have been put forward as uh, men who would um, like to do something more for the war effort. Is, is this uh, something? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, everything we can. The auxiliary unit was a resistance force in waiting, a last line of defense against Nazi invasion. Steve Mason is an expert on the auxiliary units stationed here on the south coast. Do you think you could kill another man in cold blood? <sighs> Tough. This is the sort of questions were, that were being put to people at the time, farmers? Absolutely, time. absolutely. But it really comes down to your personal mettle. So this is something beyond the home guard. This is actually a sort of secret service, isn't it? Absolutely. Just like the cells are setting up in Europe at the same time, yeah. a resistance movement. Obviously, you've heard of Home Guard, but why don't we hear of these guys? Because the people who joined this particular resistance movement had to sign the Official Secrets Act. So I suppose if, during the war, if we were held back in a reserved occupation and we were of a certain age, mm. then we'd be seen as kind of Absolutely. people who both knew the land, totally. being farmers, and also quite able-bodied. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So these are photographs of the men who actually were the auxiliaries for this locality. Yep. Mm. Um, you were never to discuss this thing, ever. Mm. I've spoken to, to one surviving auxiliary who was 18 at the time. Right. So he's young enough still now yeah. to, to talk about it. He only wants to discuss the people in that photograph who are dead. With the Nazis poised to invade, the auxiliary unit were ready to go to ground and form a guerrilla network to destroy the enemy's infrastructure. Their instruction manuals were cunningly disguised. It's got a cover, mm. so if a German invading just picked it up, they would hopefully think that it was an out-of-date calendar and not look inside. And this tells you how to handle explosives. And again, more tricks of the trade, how to blow up a petrol tank, mm. um, how to blow up railway lines. Oh. Do you think, putting yourselves back there, would you really actually have signed up for this? What do you think? I, it's, I, I, think, I think so. If you're a reserved occupation, like a farmer, for example, is there going to be a sense that you want to be out there on the, on the front line? Although you're, you're farming, mm. there's a sense that you're going to want a bit of action. Sort and of the, itching to get involved. Yeah, I, I wonder whether that might have played a part in, in peop, some, some people signing up. Uh, a number of them do say that. They, they actually just wanted to get their, their hands on, on some action, as corny as it sounds. Unbeknown to the boys, like many farmers' wives, Ruth, too, has been conscripted into secret service. Gardening has taken on a whole new significance for me, particularly this potting shed, because whilst the boys think I'm working in the garden and they're well out of the way in the fields, what I'm really doing in here is this. Ruth's been recruited into the special duties section. Their mission, to handle communications between the auxiliary units in the field and HQ. This is my aerial. About three and a half thousand people were involved. Vicars, barmaids, farmers, farmers' wives and housewives. And yet, almost nobody knows about it. They really just kept that quiet. There are instances in which uh, a wife was doing this with the radio whilst the husband was out doing um, other auxiliary work and neither of them told each other until they were in their 80s or 90s, years and years and years later. In some ways, I say, it's comical, but it's also really serious. People were expecting to be invaded. They were expecting that this sort of work put their lives in serious danger. If you'd been caught with the radio, when the Germans came. You were looking not just at execution, but probably at torture too. Informant confirms successful patrol, maneuver, four men, evidence of explosives, northwest of Arbo Wood. Approximate time, 0015. Location, Hamble, G. 
Despite their important top secret military duties, the priority for farmers was doubling crop production to feed the nation. Although the team were unable to mold drain the boggy field, the task now is to plow as quickly as possible in preparation for sowing the wheat. With the days drawing shorter, the War Agricultural Committee encouraged farmers to plow on into the night. Got to, we've got to plow through the night, and this was, of course, something that was expected uh, during the war. Um, not something I think people did willingly, really, but um, unfortunately, we've just, we've just got to do this because we're so behind. Plowing at night creates unique problems. Right, so this is our lantern, and it's just in the hedge, and it's going to give something for Ruth to fix on, on the horizon so she can drive theoretically in a straight line. I'm a bit worried, though, about using these lights with the blackout. I reckon the, the lamps and the hedge probably could be hidden from yeah. the air anyway. Yeah. And this one's already got a hood on it. Yeah. And this lamp will be moving. So I just aim at the light in the hedge? Yep, that's the idea. Think about the horseman out there with his horses gently ploughing away in the quiet, perhaps on a nice sunny spring morning. But during the Second World War, ploughing was a very, very different monster. And the plough really had become a weapon of war. It was the farmer's principal weapon of war. Now, I'm not entirely sure we're getting this right, but we're putting our all into it, and, and Ruth's doing a fantastic job. Hopefully, by the end of the month, we'll have the field done. Next morning, Ruth is called into action by the special duties section. Her mission? To pass a message on to the auxiliary unit. Hampshire, with its strategic ports of Southampton and Portsmouth, was a key target for invasion. So more auxiliary units were stationed here than any county in Britain. Military expert Gerald Sutcliffe is leading Alex and Peter's patrol. What we're going to now is an OB, an operational base. So we've got basically a little bunker where we've already got some equipment, munitions and rations in. Let's go and have a look at it now, shall we? It's all over the country, around the coast in particular, groups like us. We're going to be providing a nasty surprise to her Hitler. Unlike the other countries which have had the unfortunate experience of his jackboots going over them, we are ready. We're going to come up behind him and going to blow up his petrol dumps. We're going to blow up his ammunition dumps. We're going to sabotage his tanks. We're going to shoot his officers, anybody that helps him. The aim was to transform ordinary farmers with no military experience into guerrilla saboteurs. Alex has picked up the message dropped by the special duties section with details of a training exercise. We've been left a note advising us that a German patrol uh, of 10 men is expected, at the moment my thoughts are, um, we'll ambush their patrol. We've got another... This is a typical exercise passed on by the mysterious Agent R. Agent R, I wonder who that could be. That's the point. You will never know, and neither will I. You'll never know the members of the intelligence section. They don't know you. They just leave little messages for us. And we pick them up and we never see them, or they us. Training by night, then working in the field by day, meant a wartime farmer could find himself working 17-hour days. Two members of the team to go up on the ridge line 
Well, I go down and I rig, rig a couple of surprises, yeah. right? And one of you can cover me while that's going on. Why do I have to go in front all the time, Peter? Alex and Peter keep watch from the ridge line. Following instructions set out in the auxiliary unit manual, Gerald sets a booby trap. What I'm going to rig up is a grenade with a pin removed, but sufficient pressure on top of it so that when somebody kicks it, it's going to release the lever and go bang. OK. And rejoin the others. This being an exercise, there are no Germans, and Jerry's grenade is simply a thunder flash. Well, good for a first attempt. You think so? I think so. They would have used all sorts of methods to simulate combat. OK. I did it that way because you weren't expecting it, to add that bit of tension and realism. Yeah. So you were both conditioning us and testing us at the same time? Yes. Alex, Ruth and Peter have now been wartime farmers for two months. For Ruth, the work in the fields has left little time for domestic duties. So she's taken another step towards modernising the kitchen by fitting lino. Fantastic! You often hear, you know, about labour-saving things in the kitchen and you sort of imagine it's all about gadgets. Nah. It's about things like this. The things that make the big difference. So instead of spending, you know, 45 minutes twice a day on the floor, like you might have to with a stone flag floor, I can run over with a mop and bucket in 10 minutes. The paraffin stove is also helping to save time. Unlike an old-fashioned coal range, it's up and running in seconds. Ruth's using it to cook a quick meal from her 1930s cookbook. Fried bacon with bananas. It's such an odd recipe to find in a late 30s book. It took me so by surprise. This bacon's going to become a thing of scarcity. By 1939, we were already bringing in quite a significant proportion of our bacon from Denmark. And then the bananas go in, the butter. Bananas would soon disappear completely from the shops as the government requisitioned banana boats to import materials essential to the war effort. From the declaration of war in September 1939 until May 1940, no bombers appeared overhead and the gas attacks didn't materialise. It became known as the Phony War. But by June 1940, after the British had been driven into the sea at Dunkirk, the mood was darkening. France fell to the Nazis, and as the new Prime Minister Winston Churchill warned, Britain was next in line. And growing strength in the air, we shall defend our island, whatever the cost may be. We shall fight on the beaches, we shall fight on the landing grounds, we shall fight in the fields and in the streets, we shall fight in the hills, we shall never surrender. I think it's fun, interesting, isn't it? You know, that's, those, that speech is so iconic. Mm. It must have been terrifying for people as well to think that, you know, there, there could possibly have been fighting on the beaches and, and in the fields. And somewhere like Hampshire, where we are, a gather would be sort of on the front line. Well, it is yeah. the whole problem, isn't it, of looking back at the war. We know that we won. Mm. Mm. People at the time did not know that. So I suppose the farms at the time They'd have really been, hopefully, I suppose, buoyed up to get a success in that harvest. Mm. It would have loaded a lot of pressure on their shoulders. Mm. You know, it would have really, I think, hammered home just how important it would have been to have brought that crop in and to have brought a brilliant crop in as well. And, that, and that's all about the connectedness too, isn't it? You mm. know, everybody's hearing that all together. 
you feel like you've absolutely got to do it right to do justice to mm. the effort that was put in, you know, from well, 39... I certainly feel that. I really feel a, a big responsibility to mm. those people who went through this and who are still alive, you know. Mm. It, it's sort of not something to be taken lightly, is it? No. We're messing with people's memories as well as with Britain's history. Well, indeed, indeed. <laughs> hello. I'm put that curtain, you know. I'll be all right, don't worry. Oh, hello, Steve. Good evening, Peter. Oh, Thank you. Hello. Hello, Ruth. Hello, Dr. Chair. Come and join us. Take your seat. Take your seat. How are you? Good to see you today. You're in luck. Have a cake. Good grief. Have a clear. <laughs> I'm on my rounds. I have to say, what a marvellous job you've done with all your windows there. Oh, yes. Absolutely. Peter, brilliant. I told you there. But. <laughs> Oh. You're going to be in for a fine because you're showing the light under your door. Really? Really? You haven't put the curtain up. So what is what is the consequences? The county court will summon you. Anything from three shillings to seven and six, I would think. Of course, the other thing to mention is the excessive lights that you're burning. For a small room, you've got three lights. Mm. So that would incur another fine. Oh, good grief. Oh, Lord. <laughs> it's, it's, it's I was that... just enjoying having electricity. <laughs> it's, it's that classic thing when you're not physically doing the thing, like filling your oil lamp, if you've just got electricity, you don't think about the power source and how much you're using. Mm. Well, I think we should enjoy these desserts while we can, because I think from now on in, things are only going to get tougher, aren't they? Mm. Much like this guy. I'll put this one out. Mm. <laughs> and the radio. Let's get this curtain up, then. Teams back on track with the task of increasing the farm's food production. The wheat field is ploughed. Next, it's harrowed to break up the earth. Then sowed with the wheat seed. If all goes well in nine months' time, they should have a good crop to harvest. We have cracked on, haven't we? We really have cracked on. A million acres, was it, they ploughed up extra? In 39? By the spring of uh, 1940, 1 1.7 million acres. Extra. Extra. On top Extra. of what they were already doing. On top of what they already did. And a lot of farmers said it couldn't be done. You know, they shook their yeah. heads and said, no, you can't, can't do that, can't you can't do that. that. But, you and know. then they turned around and did it. Wartime farmers didn't know it yet, but this was just a start. They still had five years of war to endure, and conditions were only going to get tougher as they struggled to feed the nation. <laughs> Next, on Wartime Farm, the team faced the conditions of 1940 and the Blitz. They confront rationing. That's particularly hard to make last the week. Make use of every last resource and there's temptation round every corner. You're well on your way to becoming a, a black, black marketeer. marketeer. To find out how Britain fed itself during the Second World War and how rationing affected the wartime diet, order the Open University's free wartime farm booklet. Call 0845 366 0257 or go to bbc.co.uk slash wartime farm and follow the links to the Open University. Top tips on working your own small patch of land tomorrow here on BBC HD with Gardener's World at 9. But next, though, we meet the women at the top with Hilary Devane.